Hello, I'm Gordon Palmer, Minister here at Claremont Parish Church, and this is our service for Sunday, August the 1st. First Sunday of the month when we've been celebrating communion, um, albeit in our own respective homes or wherever we find ourselves. So if you wish to take part in the communion part of the service, do have bread and wine or alternatives uh, with you for that part of the service. Anna Weir will be helping me at the communion part of the service today. It's Jan Weir um, who's doing the Bible reading. Morag Drumgold is leading us in our prayers for others. And Alison Ross is doing the signing. Jesus said, When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me, because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. We give thanks for the ministry of the Spirit. We give thanks that the Spirit's ministry is uh, throughout the world. We give thanks that the Spirit is alive and at work. And we come together in praise of God, representing, as it were, all the church, all of creation, all people that on earth do dwell. Let us pray, and we will gather up our prayers in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Lord God, we thank, we praise you for being a giving God, a God who gives and gives again. We thank you that you're a God who reaches out, a God who sends, a God who makes the first move. We thank you that you're a God who does this in and out of love. We thank you for the gift of Jesus. We thank you for Jesus coming, his seeking out lost people like us, his reaching out to people who had neglected, people who had rejected your gift of life. We thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit, so that Jesus is not just a figure in the past, but with us now. 
the gift of your Spirit so that we are not alone, so that we need not rely on fading memory or past glory, but rather can enjoy your life with us, in us, around us, here and now. We give thanks for the unselfish, open way of your giving. We give thanks, and as we later celebrate in these gifts of bread and wine, celebrate in the, in the meal of your supper. So we recall how even that supper speaks to us of you coming to us in the ordinary and every day, coming to us and reaching out and bringing new life. Lord God, you warn us in your word that we can neglect and sometimes we can't quench your Holy Spirit. Forgive us for the times we've done that and turned our back on you. Forgive us for the times when we thought you don't really matter, you're not looking, or when we've let selfish desires get on top. And gracious God, you promised a new start to all who properly repent. So might we now know the disappointment of letting you down? But then, Lord, might we move on to know the release and restored peace of being once more forgiven and at one with you? So, gracious God, giving God through your Holy Spirit, Assure us of your presence with us and your love for us. And so help us enjoy the presence of a living Savior, our Lord Jesus, in whose words we pray. Our Father in heaven. Good morning. We continue reading from the book of Ezekiel this week, and today we're going to read from chapter 25, verses 1 to 7, and then from chapter 26, verses 1 to 14. Ezekiel chapter 25, verses 1 to 7. The Lord spoke to me. Mortal man, he said, denounce the country of Ammon. Tell them to listen to what I, the Sovereign Lord, am seeing. You were delighted to see my temple profaned, to see the people of Judah go into exile. Because you were glad, I will let the tribes from the eastern desert conquer you. They will set up their camps in your country and settle there. They will eat the fruit and drink the milk that should have been yours. I will turn the city of Rabbah into a place to keep camels and the whole country of Ammon into a place to keep sheep so that you will know that I am the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord is saying. You clapped your hands and jumped for joy. You despised the land of Israel. Because you did, I will hand you over to other nations who will rob you and plunder you. I will destroy you so completely that you will not be a nation anymore or have a country of your own. Then you will know that I am the Lord. On the first day of the month of the 11th year of our exile, the Lord spoke to me. Mortal man, he said, this is what the people in the city of Tyre are cheering about. They shout, Jerusalem is shattered. Her commercial power is gone. She won't be a rival anymore. Now then, this is what I, the Sovereign Lord, am saying. I am your enemy, city of Tyre. 
I will bring many nations to attack you, and they will come like the waves of the sea. They will destroy your city walls and tear down your towers. Then I will sweep away all the dust and leave only a bare rock. Fishermen will dry their nets on it, there where it stands in the sea. I, the Sovereign Lord, have spoken. The nations will plunder Tyre, and with their swords they will kill those who live in her towns, on the mainland. Then Tyre will know that I am Lord. The Sovereign Lord says, I'm going to bring the greatest king of all, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylonia, to attack Tyre. He will come from the north with a huge army, with horses and chariots and with cavalry. Those who live in the towns on the mainland will be killed in the fighting. The enemy will dig trenches, build earthworks and make a solid wall of shields against you. They will pound on your walls with battering rams and tear down your towers with iron bars. The clouds of dust raised by their horses will cover you. The noise of their horses pulling wagons and chariots will shake your walls as they pass through the gates of the ruined city. Their horsemen will storm through your streets, killing your people with their swords. Your mighty pillars will be thrown to the ground. Your enemies will help themselves to your wealth and merchandise. They will pull down your walls and shatter your luxurious houses. They will take the stones and the wood and all the rubble and dump them into the sea. I will put an end to all your songs and I will silence the music of your harps. I will leave only a bare rock where the fishermen can dry their nets. The city will never be rebuilt. I, the Sovereign Lord, have spoken. Amen. Well, over, over time, different themes, ideas, emphases, values, opinions, they, they come and go. Many people carry the assumption that things, of course, are, are better now, that we have become more learned, more able, and that we're always improving. Others see the past as the good old days. Mostly what we do see is a limited perspective about what goes on in our part of the world, and a limited perspective in terms of the information we have and, uh, and so on. A limited awareness even of what has influenced us and helped us make up our minds. For years, um, statues have stood in Bristol, Glasgow, Edinburgh, and other places, and nobody thought much about it at all. For years, it was commonplace to tell jokes about the Irish being thick, about the Jews being mean, and about the football team called Partick Thistle Nil. But even uh, as some try to repent of the past, even while some maybe want to airbrush the past out, we cannot do it, ever do that, any of that with the certainty that we, we see the whole picture. Doesn't mean we shouldn't try, we certainly should. And for example, women being able to vote, having access to many jobs, access to tertiary education, having better pay and so on, all of that much better than it was the case at the beginning of the 20th century. But then someone points out that the family unit has become more fragile and so on, and so other knock-on effects. And we see that there's drawbacks even when progress is welcome. It's a very painful lesson being worked out just now in distressing ways in South Africa. The dismantling of apartheid was the removal of a great evil. How we celebrated that it happened without a lot of bloodshed. But now flaws are to the fore and there's plenty of bloodshed at the moment. So do please pray for South Africa. And then we need to be careful that ideas and themes that we might play down or disparage might have a grain or more than a grain of truth to them. 
things that are deemed out of order now might have had some positive aspects that we are missing. And in the mix of trying to work all of that out, Christians have to live in the world. We have to join others in making the kind of decisions and judgments. But we are not to do so just with the current mood or latest theory being our final standard, but it's the gospel revealed to us in Scripture that is the final matter, in all, final authority rather, in all matters of faith and conduct. Now, one of the themes of Scripture that some find hard to stomach in this current era is that of judgment. If God is a God of love, surely He forgives. He won't judge, and certainly not in the harsh terms expressed in various bits of the Bible. I won't have time to broaden out that question um, and make some responses to it uh, today, but we'll do so in the discussion this week and taking it further on Tuesday evening. On Tuesday evenings, when from seven o'clock, we've been uh, following up the, the service themes and um, the link to how you can join um, taking it further is um, at the bottom of the screen here. And one of the points raised last week from Ezekiel chapter 16 is that God's judgment was not just some angry deity stamping his foot because he hasn't got his way. Rather, it was the expression of, of love rejected, the loving response when something wonderful and precious is made light of. You see, God cares, and he cares about all the world, all of life. Ezekiel is learning that lesson bit by bit. He'd been brought up to be someone who was earmarked to become a priest at the age of 30. He was going to serve in the temple, and the temple was probably the be-all and end-all. And now, in an exile in Babylon, he was learning that God is not just concerned about what happens in the Jerusalem temple. God had shown him in a vision that he was with the exiles even in Babylon. He had spoken of restoration for others, for Samaria and Sodom at the end of chapter 16 that we looked at last week. And now in chapters 25 to 32, a kind of discrete section in the book of Ezekiel, um, there's a series of judgments on the surrounding nations. For although much of the Old Testament focuses on Israel, the call to Abraham uh, back in Genesis chapter 12 had a world focus, <clears throat> and the creation and the associated stories too in the first 11 chapters of Genesis have the, the whole world as the background. And Israel's calling time and again was affirmed that they were to be the Lord's witnesses to the nations, the Lord's ambassadors in the world. Not only had Israel failed to do that, but the nations around were part of what caused Israel to fail, and so they bore their guilt too. And so God's judgment was to fall. But again, this judgment was in the context of the wider salvation plans made known to Abraham and reaffirmed in many places in the Old Testament, such as the final verses in Ezekiel 16 that we looked at last week. And it was all spelt out even more clearly when the risen Jesus came to his disciples, Matthew chapter 28, and, and told them that they were to go into all the world. You see, God is sovereign over all the world, beginning then with a word against um, Ammon in, in verses 1 to 7 of chapter 25. Beginning with that, Ezekiel is given words against seven nations. And that's a kind of recognized number, a recognized feature in such messages. Amos, for example, condemned seven nations before turning on Israel. The pre-Israelite nations that were living in Canaan were listed in Deuteronomy chapter 7 as being seven in number. And then finally in Scripture, the book of Revelation, the risen Jesus speaks letters to the churches. It's to the seven churches. Seven is a number associated with fullness and completeness. And so, in having a word for seven of the nations, symbolically, Ezekiel is saying, this is a word for all the world over. This is a, a word for everywhere, because God reigns everywhere. Even those who don't acknowledge God are responsible to Him. All of us have life because of God. 
It is not that some were created by the Lord, others were created by uh, Vishnu, others were created by Buddha, others were created by Allah, and, and some just evolved from the Big Bang or whatever. No, we all owe our existence to God. And we all live in God's universe. And we're all loved by God, sustained by Him, and have responsibilities to live His way. Now, there are issues about how much some people might know about the Lord, and again, we can maybe pick that topic up on, on Tuesday night. But it is not the case that there is some tribal God that we follow, and those in other parts of the world, those in other tribes, can do their own thing. If the story in Scripture is true, then it is Jesus alone who is God's eternal Son. Jesus alone who is the light of the world, the Lamb of God, the Savior of the world. There is no other story, no other God, no other alternative. Now again, this is something that very much goes against the grain of the times in which we live where at least it's claimed, if not lived out, that, well, we all can have an opinion, and what you think is true might be true for you, but not for someone else, and so on. Although how our society um, holds to that and also spits out the vitriol that spat out on social media, for example, I don't, I don't know, for we're quick to point the finger and condemn. We can't even live up to that supposed article of faith. But that's, that's basically officially it, that there is no uh, ultimate truth. There's no exclusive truth. But Jesus did make claims that did not leave room for anyone else to be on a par with him. And if the gospel is about the graciousness of God reaching out to us and not about what we do, what we think, what we make ourselves into, then loyalty to any alternative is a rejection of that grace, a rejection of the claim that God has come to us as opposed to what we might like to construct. Now, later in the book, Ezekiel will present the Lord as struggling with a dilemma. On the one hand, the sin of Israel was such that the Lord had to punish, but as He punished, that brought disgrace on His own reputation. The nations around were saying, Phew, can't it be much of a God if all that's happening to Israel? Have you seen what Israel are going through? Phew, their God must be a real rotter or must have gone away. And so God knew that was the case, but so beyond His punishing of Israel, was a commitment to restore and to gather them from exile. And that would be for the sake of his own reputation amongst the nations. And so we have in, in chapter 36 of Ezekiel at verse 22, Therefore say to the Israelites, this is what the sovereign Lord says, It is not for your sake, people of Israel, that I am going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name. That's what God said, referring to the restoration, Ezekiel 36, verse 22. It's for the glory of God. It's God so who is sovereign over all the world. But also, as Ezekiel gives us these um, prophecies, uh, chapters 25 and following, he was reminding us that great and mighty world powers would rise and then fall again. The world is not going to be trampled and smashed by brutal, immoral regimes forever. A day will come when God is going to bring an end to the state war machines, the terrorist bombs, the totalitarian oppression, the gas chambers, the death camps, the killing fields, and so on. There will be a judgment. There will be a time of ultimate justice and healing and renewal, ultimately. The salvation of God is not simply going to be an improving of things here and there and making things a bit more bearable, but a final judgment and renewal. So don't put your hopes elsewhere, says the, the gospel writers. Salvation is not found in political movements, in scientific discoveries and in human philosophies. Important as these things are, and they all have a place. No, the renewal and the restoration of the whole of creation comes through one given to us, a Savior from heaven, 
who is intimately related to humanity when he became one of us in Jesus of Nazareth. And now, more than Ezekiel, we have the benefit of seeing that pro promise lived out in Jesus and the promise reaffirmed of how he will come again and how his pur God's purposes will ultimately flourish. And that is the backdrop against which nations come and go, empires rise and fall. Now, it's particularly significant for our time, I think, that one of the seven judgments um, is on Tyre, chapter 26. You see, Tyre's power and influence was not built on military might. They didn't have the, the best armies and the, um, the biggest tanks and all that kind of stuff. No, the reason that Tyre was in the ascendancy was because of its strong economic base. In the 20th century, we saw totalitarian regimes come and go. Stalin's Russia, the Third Reich, and so on. But we also saw in that century, and, and moving more and more emphatically into this century, the rise of, of colossal economic forces. Now, partly that was um, to do with the strength of particular nations like the USA and China and so on. But increasingly, economic dominance is moving away from countries and being achieved by companies, some of them controlled by incredibly wealthy individuals. And well over half of the biggest economies in the world today are not in fact countries, but companies. Companies whose turnover is greater than the, the gross domestic product of many a nation. But again, Ezekiel is saying, these, these economic empires, just like the military ones, will not last forever, because it is the purposes of God that are to be fulfilled. And it's the purpose of having fellowship with people that God is ultimately doing and building. The promise that held out is not a better society, a more fair or equitable distribution, better health care, and so on but rather is to do with God's original purpose of knowing and being known. No fewer than 15 times in the chapters 25 to 32, no fewer than 15 times in these oracles against the nations does the phrase come, then you, or then they, will know that I am the Lord. Because that's what God's after, that we will know him, know that he's the Lord have fellowship with him, so that the final picture in, in Revelation is, is not um, just of some kind of economic or military conquest, but is of God living face to face with his people among them in fellowship. And it is the awareness of the glory of God being good, being right, being fit for all peoples that feeds Ezekiel's faith as he declares God's words even when these words are the unpopular messages of judgment. Whatever takes place on the international arena can only do so under the sovereign will of God. But it will also serve ultimately His purposes to extend the knowledge of the Lord as God. The goal of all God's action. And so the central passion of his prophet's life and witness is for God to be known and acknowledged, for the Lord to be adored for who he truly is. And that surely is the very same mission and purpose for all of God's people. And that has always been the case. Much earlier on in Israel's history, the prophet Elijah prayed for Israel as he was confronting the false god of Baal. And at the time of the sacrifice, 1 Kings 18, at the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel. That's what he's wanting it to be known. He's not wanting people to say what a great guy he is. He's wanting God to be adored and known as God. 
and so through into the New Testament and, and Jesus himself, and as he prayed on the eve of his arrest and, and crucifixion. His prayer was not just for the disciples, verse 20 of John 17, but he prays for all of his people, that you, that you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in, us, be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. That's what Jesus is after. I have given them glory that you gave me, that they may become one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. How's the world going to know that Jesus is Lord? By the unity of his people, by the concern for the glory of God. So Elijah's prayer that Israel must know, Jesus' prayer was that the world must know about the glory of the living God. What mattered to Ezekiel was that both in Israel and in the world of the nations around, the glory of God would be revealed. The honor of God's name would be restored and the truth of God's identity would be known. It is a right and a proper challenge to ask ourselves if our motivation is as God-centered as that. Let us pray. In all kinds of ways, some of which we notice, some of which we don't notice, we put ourselves right at the center. We make ourselves out to be the ones around whom the world revolves. Trouble is everyone else has got the same idea. And Lord, it's a recipe for impoverishment of life, not enrichment of life. So help us to hear again Jesus' words about it being better to give than to receive, about the last being first, about serving. And might there be in our ways, Lord, that concern to see you get all the glory, you to get the praise. Keep us from doing mission to make ourselves feel better, from doing mission to build up the membership of a, a club called church. Rather, give us this deep longing for the glory of God to be important, to really matter. In Jesus' name, amen. As we prepare to celebrate in the supper the communion hymn, Table of Grace. Hear the good news, you've been invited, no matter what others may say, your darkest sins will be forgiven. the table of grace the cups never empty the plates always full and it's never too Never end. 
So we come to the communion part of our service and I hope you've got bread or wine and, or alternatives there if you wish to take part with us in, in this um, memorial of Jesus and this celebration of his commitment to us and sacrifice for us. We take the communion not because our faith is strong, but because we express our need in Jesus to be a saviour. We take it not because we are good people, we're not, we are sinners saved by grace. We take it because we know we need the mercy and salvation of Christ. And so we come with that expectancy of the promises of God receiving us. And as we come, so we affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. And the form of the creed that we're using, the words for that will be in the screen. I believe in God. That's For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For when you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. And let us pray. Lord God, we lift our hearts to you in praise. We lift our hearts to you in thanksgiving. We thank you for the love of Jesus who came among us to stand where we stand, to taste what we taste, to share what we share. He didn't stay where it was easy and safe, but was not a stranger to the darkest night or even the deepest sorrow. And we thank you that in love and out of love, he bore the weight of guilt, the pain of death and the hell of separation on the cross. But how we thank you and how we rejoice that the crucified one was raised again. How we thank you that from Jesus' death comes life. From his judgment comes forgiveness. From his forsakenness comes fellowship with God. And we thank you that the Holy Spirit of the risen Christ is with us now. Is at work in the world, bringing light to its dark corners and establishing further your coming kingdom of peace and love and justice. And so remembering Jesus' work and calling on the worth of his sacrifice, we pray that your spirit may be with us no matter where we are. May we know you in all your fullness May the bread and the wine bring to us the very life of Jesus himself. 
Amen. And so we remember how our Lord Jesus, on that very night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and after he'd given thanks for it and blessed it, he broke it and said, this is my body, and it's, it's broken for you. Do this remembering me. And later, he took the cup, saying, this cup is a new covenant made in my blood and shed for the forgiveness of sins. When you drink it, drink it, remembering me. These then are the gifts of God, and they're for the people of God. So, take and eat. The body of Christ was broken for you. the blood of Christ, shed that the sins of the world could be forgiven. Drink from it, remembering him. Let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank you for this meal in which we have shared. We thank you for your faithful promises that you have made to your people and you are keeping. And as we have received your life, so help us give. Help us to be ready to share your light and your life in the world around us. Forgiven, may we be set free to live in the freedom that's in Christ and to share the good news, not just of what you've done, but of what you're doing and the completion of your kingdom when Christ comes again. Amen. Morak Drumgold is going to be leading us in our prayers for others, and afterwards we'll conclude our service with the hymn, Jesus is Lord, and then bless one, uh, <clears throat> bless one another in the words of the grace. But firstly, Morag's leading us in prayer. Let's pray together. Gracious God, as we come before you now, we thank you that we're here because of your open invitation to us. We know that, as our loving Father, you welcome us with open arms, saying, come in, nice to see you, and maybe it's been a while, where have you been? So, Father, thank you that no matter how long it's been, how much we've ignored you, you're always there waiting for us and loving us without fail. Lord, through the wonder of technology, we are able to join together now but we are mindful that the readings, message and prayers have through necessity been recorded at various times over several days and that there, are, there may have been major events or personal experiences during that time which have affected us and need our prayers. So in a moment of silence, we bring before you those things which have been foremost in our, in our minds and in our hearts the last few days. Father God, as we try to live our lives once again as normally as possible, we remember that the cloud of COVID-19 still hangs over us. So we pray yet again for all those who are ill or still suffering the effects of the virus or long COVID, those caring for them and treating them, those still working to improve, produce and administer the vaccines, 
and all who are striving to keep the economy going and those who provide us with our daily needs and indeed so much more. We pray too, Lord, for those who are in mourning and mourning loved ones who have passed because of the virus or during the pandemic. And we ask for comfort in their heartfelt loss. We raise all these people up to you now, Lord, and remember and pray for those millions of people all over the world who still have little or no vaccine, multiple other disadvantages and problems, and very little help or support. Lord, we ask that those who have will give with generous hearts. Recently, we've seen uprising and protests in various places, including South Africa, where the people struggle for so long for equality and recognition. We pray for all those suffering injustice, persecution, oppression, and ask for wisdom for all who have the privilege of authority over others. In recent weeks, there has been a huge increase in the number of people, including unaccompanied children, fleeing their homelands to find a better life. So many crowding into small inadequate boats across the English Channel, the Mediterranean Sea and the seas around China. Many have given everything they have to people traffickers who have absolutely no interest in whether these people reach their destination safely or not. Lord, help us to have compassion for all refugees. Help us to try and imagine how bad life must be that would make what anyone risk their life and the lives of their children in this way. And we pray for those whose job it is to look after the ones who manage to survive with an increasing lack of resources. Lord, we've seen the devastation caused by heavy rain and flooding in Germany, Belgium and the Netherlands and China, while at the same time, much of North West America is quite literally frying in intense heat. We're told that all this is the result of global warming, and we ask that you would show us how to help fix it. We pray for the forthcoming COP26 conference in Glasgow and ask for wisdom for all who will be attending and making decisions on behalf of the whole world population. It seems that the local council have plans to spruce up the area around the conference centre so that the delegates will get a good impression of the city. Lord, good impressions are not enough. We have to find solutions and implement them. Please show them and us how. Please let the decision makers realise that covering over the cracks is no longer enough. The decisions taken may not please everyone, but they might just be enough to save this beautiful world, which you created for us and gifted to us for a few more generations. We pray, Father God, for our local community and our church here in Claremont. We pray for all who are working to keep this a good place to live and pray that initiatives and incentives will be embraced by the community and that, that your church will have a part to play and perhaps even instigating. We give thanks for our ministry team, Gordon, Miriam, Stephen, Martin, and others who lead us so faithfully. We pray too, Lord, that we will be mindful that while they are working so hard to serve us in Jesus' name and to give you all the glory, that they too have families, loved ones, concerns and issues in their day-to-day -day lives and that we must lovingly support and encourage them in every way we can and pray for them and each other constantly. We pray especially for our prayer diary team, Hannah, Dorothy and Christine, who faithfully put together our prayer diary month after month. Lord, there are times when we are a, a low ebb in a dark place, when we can't always find words to bring to you. We know that you know what's in our hearts and that words aren't always necessary. But this wonderful resource we have can focus our minds and bring us together with others sharing the same daily prayer, which has been especially poignant during this time of physical separation. So thank you for this team and this resource. Help us all to support them with ideas and contributions and most of all, to use it 
together daily. Lord, we have so much to be grateful for, so much we take for granted. These prayers don't even scratch the surface of things needing prayer. Most of all, loving Father, we thank you for the gift and sacrifice and constant presence of your presence, precious Son, Jesus, and ask that you will help us to share him with everyone and in every aspect of our lives. We pray in his precious name. Amen. Thank you.